You let yourself go and then you refine yourself as you design. More than five decades after beginning his career in New York City, architect Howard Meyer's archives were acquired by the University of Texas at Austin in its Center for American Architecture and Design. Meyer left behind not only a singular and significant body of work, but also an uncommon legacy of vision and light. The kind of career that, that, that Howard's had is not the kind of career that most young architects today would be exposed to. Architecture has always been more art than business for him. This was a shot of Temple Emanuel. In 1987, Meyer's conversations with architecture critic David Dillon, friend and patron Carolyn Clark, and archivist Lila Stilson were captured on film. Some of these interviews sat unwatched on archive shelves until now. Howard Meyer's story began on Manhattan's Upper East Side, where he was born in 1903. The Meyer family was comfortably well off and had a deep commitment to the arts and to academic achievement. His mother, Estelle, was a graduate of Hunter College and a talented pianist. His father, Emil, was a cotton merchant, but had a passion for drawing, which he passed on to his son. At age 12, Meyer was attending drawing classes at the Art Students League in Lower Manhattan, but there was no thought of a career in the arts. After schooling, he was expected to enter his father's cotton business. He was a remarkable student, and at age 16, was admitted into Columbia University. He joined a fraternity, became business manager of the student newspaper, and dated an aspiring young playwright named Lillian Hellman. Upon graduation, he set out on the traditional after-college tour of Europe. Wherever he went, he carried his sketch pad, but there was still no thought of using his artistic talents professionally. His career course didn't change until he returned to New York and his father's cotton business. In his own words, he hated it. He returned to Columbia, this time as a student of architecture. The school was still a stronghold of the century-old Beaux-Arts educational tradition. The Beaux-Arts uh, is really a, a system of architectural and art education based on the study of historical models, mostly uh, Greek models as, as far as architecture was concerned. It really dominated uh, the teaching of architecture in American universities through the 20s and into the early 30s. Columbia, for example, would have, was a Beaux-Arts a bastion in the United States. It was a very formal, a very academic, and a very conservative approach to, to architecture and architectural design. As far as uh, modernism is concerned, it was a kind of rumor that was circulating around Europe. People did know the Bauhaus, but there wasn't much first-hand evidence of it. There was no modernism that we were acquainted with. Modernism was arriving from Europe, but very slowly. It would take a 1922 competition held by a Chicago newspaper to forever change the fate of American architecture. The Tribune Tower competition was a, was a real watershed event in American architectural history because essentially it brought together the Beaux-Arts and, 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 and the first uh, flush of modernism in a, single comp in a single competition where the world could see the differences in the two styles. It was won, of course, by Raymond Hood, who designed basically a, a kind of gothic tower, rather a wonderful tower, but very definitely a tower in the Beaux-Arts tradition. Saarinen, who should have won probably, came in second with a design that was much more streamlined, that was more modern. When we first saw the whole publication of, of the work of the Chicago Tower, we were practically up in arms that Hood had won it. Meyer won a job with New York architect William Lescaz, where he was introduced to a style that was being called international modern. Its most notable practitioners were Walter Gropius, Mies van der Rohe, and Le Corbusier. 
Meyer found his inspiration in the spare, unornamented forms of Corbusier. But only in books. Meyer wanted to see the real thing. I saw Corbusier's things, and I figured I had to meet this man. Meyer graduated from architecture school and soon married. His bride, Sean, was a Texan he had met when she visited New York. In the summer of 1930, they set sail for Europe. It was their honeymoon, but it was also a sort of pilgrimage to see the buildings that were reshaping 20th century architecture. When they reached Paris, Meyer's first goal was to meet Corbusier. We struggled in my non-French, but the forms completely intrigued me. It was a whole new geometry. I was crazy about it. Meyer returned to a New York where the building boom of the 20s was winding down in the wake of the stock market crash. As the depression deepened, Meyer found himself at work on his first commission, a combination home and office for a doctor in Jamaica, Long Island. He was beginning to apply the modernist architectural principles he had seen in Europe. His design was featured in Architectural Forum magazine, and Meyer was invited to move into the Manhattan offices of Thompson and Churchill. It was a wonderful hangout. We paid rent, and we didn't have any work to do. With few paying jobs in sight, Meyer occupied his time entering design competitions. One was sponsored by New York's Architectural League. I had all of my Corbusier education at my fingertips, and I designed what I say to this day was a damn charming small house. Meyer's design won the competition and its $25 prize. Thompson and Churchill was also Frank Lloyd Wright's New York headquarters. Wright, never reluctant to offer architectural insights, was invited to critique Meyer's prize-winning design. He took one look at it and he said, young man, that column should not be out there at the edge of the balcony. It should be back under the wall, and the balcony is cantilevered. <laughs> and he was right. That was my right in education. In 1932, Thompson and Churchill sent Meyer to Albania to supervise construction of a farm school. For the young modernist, it was a crash course in architecture at its most primitive level. In Albania, neither lifestyle nor construction methods had changed for centuries. Despite the obstacles, the job was finished on schedule and gave Meyer confidence in what he could do on his own. Back in New York, Meyer and a friend set up shop to design interiors. I got back from Albania. There was no work in sight. Mara Sanders called me and said, I've taken over this furniture place. Will you come and join me? We'll do architecture and furniture or whatever we can get. Prohibition had just been repealed, and Chandley Distillers wanted a new club room to showcase their Cuban rum. Meyer and Sanders were hired to design the whole package, including the furniture and even the labels on the liquor bottles. Design meant everything. You didn't simply design a space. You designed the things that went into the space. You see that very clearly in Howard's work, where he's designing furniture in the 1930s, first for commercial clients, then he's designing the furniture in his own house, then he's designing the furniture in the interior spaces in the houses in the 40s and 50s, and it persists right into the larger projects. You did everything, and that's a persistent theme in, uh, in his work, and it comes right out of the Bauhaus. In 1935, with the economy still slow, Meyer accepted an offer to design a home in Dallas. He didn't expect to stay long. He was looking for temporary work, something to tide him over until the Depression eased in his native New York. Dallas was not a suffering city from anything that I had heard when I got down here. It was always a fairly up-and-coming city and probably well ahead of anything up east as far as general prosperity went. But Meyer's new enthusiasm for Dallas was soon to be put to the test. I had uh, come down more or less with the idea that I was going to do some work for Louis Hexter and I made some sketches for it. It didn't get built. After a few weeks, I realized I need a job. 
Dallas, unlike most of the country, had plenty of work for architects. It was gearing up to build 26 major buildings for the Texas Centennial, just nine months away. Meyer hired on with Roscoe DeWitt, the architect designing the Dallas Museum of Fine Arts. During those early months, I worked night and day. I'd go down and be there at 8 or 8.30 in the morning and come home at 12 at night. We were, we were just working like fools to get the drawings out. And I would have sworn it was never going to be done on time. The thing went out to bid in February and was finished on June 4th. Oh. It was an absolute miracle. I couldn't believe that it could happen. You did the doors, the bronze doors? Yeah, the bronze doors. You designed them? Yes. The centennial was a very important event for the city, very important because of what it did for the economy of the city. It basically helped to lift the whole area out of the Depression. It was the first opportunity that a lot of Dallas architects had to work on large buildings at a monumental scale, in some cases the only time in their career that they ever had that opportunity. Meyer liked what he had found in Dallas. The city was young and growing. Meyer was meeting the people who would be his clients in the years ahead. The move back east was postponed indefinitely. But Meyer was a modernist in a city where modern architecture was virtually unknown. When I came to Dallas, there were several talented firms, but their talents lay in traditional design. The residential work was for the most part, very mediocre. Until he could move clients toward a more modern architecture, Meyer accepted the realities of the Dallas marketplace. He designed a three-story Georgian home on White Rock Lake for the Sidney Hohenberg family, and in Preston Hollow, a classic Southern colonial for Morton and Hortense Sanger. For domestic architecture, for residences, nobody had ever heard of a modern house. To be a modern architect anywhere in the United States in the 30s was to be adventurous. To be a modern architect in Dallas, Texas in the 30s was positively exotic. Roscoe DeWitt was working on Highland Park High School. And I couldn't talk him into doing a modern job. The few architects who were working against that kind of uh, fashionable eclecticism were people like O'Neill Ford and David Williams. Meyer credits the acceptance of the Williams and Ford innovations with helping him sell his own new ideas. At that time, the Southwest Review was published, and a number of Neal's and Dave Williams' houses were published in it. This inspired some of the more progressive young people to get away from what was strictly period or styleless houses. His first modern commission was an East Dallas home for newlyweds Eugene and Jane Sanger. He said, all I want is a house that'll last me five years. 